from the top rope, and the great American bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Let's get into this issue. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, December 7, 1998 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Brian Hildebrand Tribute Show. WCW Contracts Ending Tons More. By Observer Staff. Pro wrestling is a world filled with a lot of negativity, from the deception, these days often more prevalent behind the scenes than in front, the backstabbing and the jealousy. But on November 29th in Knoxville, World Championship Wrestling put it all behind to honor someone to whom most fans would see as a very insignificant part of the profession. By the response of his peers, it was made evident he was anything but. WCW's unannounced ceremonies for referee Brian Hildebrand, 36, a lifelong wrestling fan who became one of the most universally well-liked people in the profession, facing the toughest fight of his life in his second battle with stomach cancer, reeked of genuine emotion. To paraphrase what Ric Flair said in what may be someday an immortal line, it wasn't a great wrestling show, it was real. Just like Hildebrand was and is a credit to his profession, what WCW did was very much a credit to the profession as well. The highlight was no doubt when Flair came out, as a surprise guest at the house show, and presented Hildebrand with a replica of the WCW World Heavyweight Championship belt and said that Hildebrand, not Ric Flair or Hulk Hogan, was really the man. The show was headlined by a match made partially because it was the match Hildebrand himself wanted to see Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko versus Eddie Guerrero and Chris Jericho. Even though it was a house show, which these days to many wrestlers means avoid more than a few bumps if at all possible, the four men worked as hard if not harder than if it was a pay-per-view match more for the audience of one than the other 4,344 fans in the building. The finish saw a referee bump, which led to Hildebrand jumping out of his ringside chair and calling for the bell as Benoit had Jericho in the crossface. At that point Hildebrand took off his shirt and was wearing a Four Horsemen t-shirt underneath it. The show opened with Mike Tenay, who was one of a number of WCW individuals responsible in putting the festivities together, giving a speech and tribute to Hildebrand, saying that if heart and determination were a measuring stick, that he'd be world champion. Tenay then brought into the ring several people who worked with Hildebrand, who has lived in the area since being brought in to referee for Jim Cornette's defunct Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Tenay introduced Tim Horner, SMW Road agent Sandy Scott, TV announcer Leigh Thatcher and Dirty White Boy and Dirty White Girl Tony and Kimberly Anthony. All gave nice speeches with White Boy, who along with Horner got nice reactions from the crowd that remembered the SMW promotion, calling Hildebrand the best referee he ever worked with. Tony Schiavone, Larry Zabishko and Bobby Heenan also came out with Heenan doing a comedy routine. Shuvani told the story about how he got the nickname Shooter, basically for Night on Nitro when the 140-pound referee snatched a fan who hit the ring to attack the wrestlers in a front face lock. The build-up led to the crowd giving Brian and wife Pam, who got married earlier this year, a standing ovation as they got into the ring where WCW him a 1998 Referee of the Year award. He was also presented with a Man of the Year award from Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Hildebrand, who started out in wrestling as a photographer for wrestling magazines, became only the third person to be given such an award, but internally at PWI this was considered entirely different than the other two in that this award was a shoot. Hildebrand, who has dropped a lot of weight because his life-threatening illness has made it difficult to eat more than a few bites of food at a time, first thanked the fans of Knoxville. He was very emotional in the ring, saying that he felt he had really lucked out twice in his life, once by achieving his dream and getting to work in pro wrestling, and the second time meeting his wife, and he was just hoping he could luck out one more time and talked about his goal of returning as a referee. After all the matches except the main event had taken place, Terry Taylor got into the ring, acting semi-heelish, telling Hildebrand that he's still his boss and ordered him to get into the ring. At this point the crowd, or at least a very small but noticeable faction, started acting like jerks and chanting for Goldberg. Taylor responded saying, Goldberg ain't here, so put a sock in it. Taylor then presented Hildebrand and his wife with a honeymoon vacation in Las Vegas when he was physically up to it. Taylor then called out Arn Anderson, Benoit and Malenko who each gave speeches. Malenko said that he hoped he would get well soon. Benoit called him the most inspiring man in the business and Anderson said that Hildebrand was to his part of the business what the four horsemen were to their part of the business. Anderson then introduced Flair in a similar manner as he did that night in Greenville, South Carolina, who gave a nice speech and presented Hildebrand with a replica title belt. The differences between WWF and WCW when it comes to being on the ball, and deception for that matter, 
was evident again on November 30th when each group went live on the day the TV Guide Pro Wrestling cover story came out. WCW had no mention of probably the single biggest media breakthrough of all a cover story in the most widely read magazine in the country. WWF played it up for all it was worth, showing the Steve Austin and Undertaker covers, and then Jim Ross said twice on the show if those copies are sold out you may have to buy a copy with the retired Hulk Hogan or the Austin wannabe Bill Goldberg on the cover. WWF also produced a deceptive and misleading quote underneath the photos, with the quote saying viewers have been abandoning the networks, for WWF's Raw is War. The actual sentence read, even against the strong seasonal pull of Monday night football and the contraction of Ally McBeal's miniskirts, Younger viewers have been abandoning the broadcast networks for World Championship Wrestling's Nitro, and the WWS Raw is War, providing TNT and the USA Network a combined Monday night audience of almost 10 million viewers, a 36% increase since last year. The story, by Bruce Newman, who also wrote the 1985 Sports Illustrated cover story on pro wrestling with Hogan on the cover which was probably the single greatest print media exposure for a wrestler and wrestling up until this week also had brief sidebars by Mark Glasswell and Neil Carlin on Goldberg, Austin Undertaker, Hogan, and Jesse Ventura. The story listed the WWF as a $500 million per year company, a myth bought even by Forbes magazine which listed Titan Sports at number 475 in the list of the 500 biggest privately owned companies in the country claiming $500 million in revenue and $475 million in expenses. We've gone through that song and dance before but if you include pay-per-view revenue, merchandise and magazine sales both at the event and through licensed products, arena tickets sold and television ad sales estimated for Titan this year the figure reaches $160 million and I'm sure there are enough millions from other sources to come close to $200 million. WCW revenue should be in the same ballpark for this year, but $500 million will become the official figure for now until the end of time because it's been so widely reported. I guess the 474 privately held companies higher than Titan Sports gross revenues could be exaggerated by every bit as much. Still, it isn't like the slightest bit of research would show the $500 million figure as not being possible. It's a lot more realistic than in 1992 when the company hit the skids when many media sources reported the wrestling revenue figure at $1.7 billion when the real figure for the entire industry in this country at that time was less than $250 million. The story listed nearly 10 million viewers every Monday, which is accurate, but then listed the total weekly wrestling audience at 34 million, which is a hard figure to accurately figure. The total weekly audience at this point for cable WWF and WCW wrestling is about 22 million, and throwing in syndication, ECW and other smaller groups and wrestling on Spanish stations, you could probably get the number up to around 26 to 30 million. Newman really didn't understand the NWO angle, as he wrote it up as if Hogan became the ringleader of a group working against Ted Turner, with Eric Bischoff playing the on-air stand-in for Turner, when in fact, it was Bischoff who played heel owner first, even if McMahon played it better. It noted since April, Raw has a 1971 edge in ratings, which, while accurate, there are several weeks where Raw had a higher rating but Nitro actually drew more viewers. But it isn't misleading to say Raw has been the dominant show for the most part since April. There was an interesting quote from Austin on the current WWF direction, saying I can't say that I agree with every storyline we have. Every time you hear some racism or a bunch of the sexual stuff, that's a complete turnoff for me. The steroid issue was brought up, with Newman suggesting that the steroid rumors may even add to wrestling's outlaw mystique. He wrote that WCW claims to have a testing program, although Bischoff remains deliberately sketchy on how it is enforced and that the WWF only tests when it detects signs of abuse, gynecomastia, Excessive back acne, water retentive physiques and changing facial structures don't count. Newman even joked asking McMahon what those signs would be, and he replied, If we found a syringe filled with steroids, we'd say, what the hell are you doing? The audience doesn't give a damn. No one cares. There was irony in that because that was the last two sentences were the same walking headlong into a disaster reaction that McMahon gave me in 1991 one year before his company hit the skids over largely that response to that same issue that no one cares about. The situations from a public standpoint are entirely different today, and I don't believe WWF would suffer similar problems because the audience is so much more fervent and desensitized when it comes to social issues. However, that statement could come back to hang McMahon if and when a WWF wrestler suffers significant negative consequences that can be traced to steroids, as has happened in the past and no doubt will happen again in, in future. In this latest media barrage, three different reporters, actually four, but one was the National Examiner so that doesn't count, 
had already decided to go with the idea that McMahon knew about the problems before instituted testing due to outside pressure, dropped the testing quietly despite having full knowledge what would happen. Some, probably many, wrestlers got back on the steroids with the testing dropped, and Brian Pillman, a known steroid user for years before and during the early part of his wrestling career, then died of a heart attack, attempting to tie Pillman's death to steroids. The fact that Pillman actually failed a steroid test, to our knowledge, about one month before he died, Pillman was the last WWF wrestler who was drug tested, for Decadurabalin just one month before he died, which isn't widely known, could have also already led to negative consequences. The only reason those stories didn't come out was in all cases me insisting to the reporters that line of reasoning, while seemingly accurate as a timeline, wasn't intellectually honest on this subject because what destroyed Pillman's heart was not steroids. That doesn't mean something won't happen next week, next year, or not for another 10 years but as anyone who has followed this profession has seen, guaranteed, it will happen at some point. And with more media visibility than ever before, pro wrestling is exactly one high-profile tragedy away from not the routine tragedy everyone in the business callously forgets about three days later, but one that keeps haunting the business for a long time. And even if it doesn't hurt business at all, it's pretty heartless not to care in the least about these things or take any preventive measures to keep them from happening again. Overall, the story was basically the same wrestling story that's being printed in every form of media on nearly a daily basis nowadays, but the exposure of being a TV guide cover story probably makes this story more important than any of the others. There wasn't much to the sidebars. Goldberg talked more about his recent car wreck when he ran his Impala into another car while talking on his cell phone. The Hogan sidebar talked about Bischoff's shocking suggestion he turn heel, if you remember that time frame, his career was completely done as a face and going heel was the only way to save him and pragmatic business as opposed to shocking would be a more correct term. Undertaker refused to answer anything about Mark Calloway, as he is the one persona, along with Austin to an extent, that even with the WWF opening up, that they protect the gimmick of mainstream. The Austin sidebar claimed he didn't last long in WCW before being fired, well, only six years, which is close to an eternity in this business, and listed him as earning $2 million per year, which has to be much lower than reality although it could be his downside guarantee, because that would make him the single most underpaid person in the history of this industry. Anything under $10 million this year is underpaid, by the old percentage of the gate standards the NWA champions from the Fez to Flair era were supposed to receive, and in those cases, often didn't as well. By traditional pro wrestling standards Austin should earn close to $16 million this year. Hey if WWF really grosses $500 million, anything less than a $2.5 million average salary for wrestlers and $20 to $25 million at least this year for Austin would be underpaid, and by NWA champ standards, 8% of the gross. Actually it was even higher, 10% during the Fez era, his take would be $40 million. Based on the old wrestling standards of talent getting 25% of the gross, in real sports the figures are in some cases 55% which I guess explains why pro wrestling is a lot more profitable of business these days than an NBA franchise and probably also explains the value and lack thereof in a multi-million dollar industry that isn't unionized. The average WWF salary this year should be $1.25 million per year and WCW, with more wrestlers, should be about $800,000 per year. Even though everyone is making more money than ever before, and in many cases working a lot less to do so, by major league sports and entertainment standards, these are not overpaid performers. Which brings us to the other major topic of the week, the future of people like the giant, Chris Benoit, Rey Mysterio Jr., Dean Malenko, Chris Jericho and Eddie Guerrero in WCW. Most of the financial figures and contract expiration dates are well known by now. Rick and Scott Steiner both signed three-year contracts, just days before their WCW deals expired, with reports ranging from $500,000 to $700,000 per year apiece, they had each been earning $315,000 on their previous deal, depending upon the source but I believe figures tending toward the lower side of that range. While most of the aforementioned names were believed to be strongly leaning toward going to WWF, all of the questions discussed on these pages and a lot of pressure by Eric Bischoff to get all of the above signed has led to a lot of questioning in their respective minds and at press time none. And that includes Giant. Are considered sure bets to leave. The basic situation is that WCW's guaranteed contracts in all cases are believed to be far more lucrative than WWF, and in all cases, the WCW schedule works out to be working far less dates. It has become a point in the cases of several WCW wrestlers to note that WCW is putting basically the same amount on the table for all the aforementioned names, with the exception of Giant, 
but they are putting substantially more on the table for, than WWF signed Rock up for a six-year deal. You know the arguments. You can earn substantially more than your contract in WWF if business keeps up at the current level while that isn't the case in WCW unless you renegotiate in the middle of the term, which with the exception of someone like Bill Goldberg, who caught fire, is something WCW usually doesn't do. A very important point among guys who work very hard in a dangerous profession is the fact that WCW deals guarantee the money while out of action due to an injury, while WWF performers are only guaranteed the downside figure, which is prorated at least in most cases on an annual basis. There may be exceptions to this and I believe there are. For example, if a wrestler's downside is $300,000. If they miss four months due to an injury but based on their gate percentage as a headliner they earn $350,000 for that year, they earn $350,000. Not $350,000 they earned on the road plus $6,000 per week for the four months receiving only base pay while injured. The other end of the spectrum is all the WCW wrestlers see wrestlers who aren't as marketable or as talented as they are getting a lot more of a chance at the top rung in WWF. There's the thought process of following the lead set by the likes of Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, who weren't pushed in WCW, went to WWF and became big stars, and then were signed by WCW when their contracts expired for what at the time was an enormous amount of money. Anyway, in all cases, Bischoff is making these next few weeks crunch time. The basic threat is that if wrestlers don't resign now, they will no longer be pushed on television. Jericho's dropping of the TV title to Conan and not getting interview time despite being generally considered the most talented interview in the company over the past few months and Guerrero's loss to Billy Kidman on the November 30th Nitro shows were both directly resultant from neither having signed the new deals presented to them over the past few weeks. There were double standards since WCW didn't do the same thing to Scott Steiner, who had also had talks with Titan until he waited until less than two weeks before his contract expired before resigning, although Steiner's intimidating presence backstage makes burying him almost feel like something potentially hazardous. Mysterio Jr. was basically given an ultimatum that if he doesn't sign his new deal, while his new contract would be a substantial raise over his current figure in the low $200,000 per year range, is much lower than what the others have been offered, partially due to the belief he has less leverage of going to WWF and being offered either any kind of comparable money or a real chance at stardom which could potentially bring him comparable money than the others. Imminently, the deal with the sizable raise would be pulled off the table. For all the reasons listed, he appears to be the least likely of the names to leave. The belief within the company during the week was that all the other names were likely to leave. Benoit went so far on November 22nd on a WCW internet audio interview, saying that if all things were equal, he'd be leaving when his contract expired at the end of 1999, which caused Bischoff to throw a fit in the middle of the pay-per-view show when he found out. Bischoff did later apologize for his reaction. Right now everything for all reasons noted, is back up in the air as Bischoff has actually presented the various other wrestlers with three-year contracts for what is believed to be $450,000 to $500,000 per year for all but Mysterio Jr., whose offer was substantially less, and Giant, whose was quite a bit more. The wrestlers are faced with actually turning down that kind of money in reality rather than in theory. Bischoff appears under the belief that when push comes to shove, the wrestlers can't afford to turn down that kind of money guaranteed for promises and Mike Bess from the other side. At the same time, it is a common reaction that Bischoff's differing attitude than McMahon makes him much harder to work with. Bischoff bullies talent in a way where they feel bullied and is more standoffish rather than warm in people relations which works with some people who aren't into the inherent phoniness of the business but they are the distinct minority, while McMahon is a lot smoother and more complimentary in dealing with fragile egos, and in being convincing with his often phony sincerity. It isn't believed that anyone with the exception of Giant possibly has been given any kind of assurances, due to what could be called tampering, of what they'd be offered, although it is certainly believed Titan won't match the offers despite being financially equipped too easily to do, so as to not rock its current salary structure. These figures have also apparently upset Juventud Guerrera, who has been the most exciting in-ring performer in the company, who just signed a three-year contract for reportedly $200,000 per less than half of what is being offered to the others, Giant was said to be asking around the locker room for advice on what he should do, indicating he's having second thoughts over his decision to leave, and being unhappy after the Goldberg squash from last week and not wanting to be squashed out on television on the way out if he doesn't resign. If recent television ratings seem to indicate that the faddish business of Japanese women's wrestling was in line for another comeback, the All Japan Women Promotion's 30th anniversary show at Yokohama Arena on November 29th did nothing to bolster that viewpoint. The combination show of Hall of Fame ceremony for the legends of the company dating back to its 1968 formation, 
drew a poor crowd of approximately 5,000 legit, the announcement was made of 7,750, in the 17,010 seat building which is something like a Japanese replica of Madison Square Garden. And if the attendance was one disappointment, the other, showing the political situation, would be the message the main event sent. On AJW's biggest show of the year, it put its biggest star, Manami Toyota, coming off losing her last interpromotional match to Shinobu Kondori and challenging for AJW's own WWWA title, the famed Red Belt, symbolic for the past two decades of being the best woman wrestler in the world, against Gia's star Chigusa Nagio, the 80s icon who in her heyday would have been the most popular woman wrestler who ever lived. But in order to make an important never-before-seen matchup of legends to headline the anniversary show, AJW Kiganagio had to agree both to let her defend her company's top belt, the all-world title, on the AJW anniversary show, and agree that Nagio was to go over. AJW, which has been in financial peril for the past few years but somehow survives on a daily cash-from-spot show's hand-to-mouth basis, and has lost much of its talent as various new offices such as Urgen and Neo Ladies have been formed. Currently there are seven full-time women's-only promotions in Japan, none of which can draw. All but one, Kyoko Inoue's Neo Ladies group, which is believed to be in the worst financial condition of all of them, were represented on the show, which also included representation of women from IWA and two male wrestlers each from Battlerts and Michinoku Pro, or a show featuring wrestlers from nine different offices. Inoue, who has herself been involved in desperation attempts to save her company, the most drastic of which was her recent shoot match against a male professional kickboxer, was actually the first one offered the main event slot against Toyota, to reprise the many incredible matches the two have had throughout the 90s, but Inoue didn't want to be involved due to bitterness from both sides as to her leaving and forming the new group. The theme of the show, both in the attendance and in the results, which told the political story, is just how poorly the AJW office has fallen. In order to get the various women's companies to be a part of its Hall of Fame show, which theoretically would be the most publicized women's wrestling show of the year, AJW had to make major booking concessions to wear on its own anniversary show, not only did its top wrestler lose the main event, but its wrestlers did jobs in most of the undercard matches and the company scored only one semi-important win in a mid-card match and gave up both its all-Pacific title and had its top tag team job for LLPW, which already holds its WWWA world title as well. Reports we got were that besides the disappointing attendance, that many fans were unhappy with the length of the show, which started at 3 p.m. and the main event didn't end until after 10 p.m., largely due to all the ceremonies with the legends who all gave speeches with their Hall of Fame inductions. While this company has put on some remarkable lengthy shows in the past, topped off by the 1995 Tokyo Dome show which lasted 10 and a half hours, the company didn't have the intense interest to sustain a seven-hour show. All Japan Women, formed by the four Matsunaga brothers in 1968, is the longest-running pro wrestling office in the world under the same owners and third-oldest active office in the world. Trailing EMLL, the oldest active office, formed by Salvador Lederoth in the 1930s, the grandfather of current President Paco Alonso, and the forerunners of today's World Wrestling Federation, which is capital sports dates back to the 50s when Vince McMahon's father Vince Sr. owned the company with Toots Mott. The company has always been one of major cyclical peaks and valleys. It achieved major popularity in the late 1970s drawing almost exclusively teenage women to see their heroines that were portrayed as both supreme fighters and rock stars, almost like a Saturday morning cartoon come to life, with names like the beauty pair. Most of the top stars in those days were teenagers themselves, as the women started very long, usually dropping out of high school at the age of 15 or 16 for brief stardom that usually ended with them being washed up by 20 or 21. It's a Japanese cultural thing where during that period, they would introduce new women rock stars and models who were in their late teens, who would become short-term superstars, and who would fade from the scene when newer and younger faces took their spots. The company for years, actually into the early 90s, had a mandatory retirement rule where the women were forced out of the company when they hit their 26th birthday. A second and many ways the biggest popularity boom started in 1984 when the crush gals, Nagio and Lioness Asuka, first became contenders for the WWWA tag team titles. The two became the highest paid women wrestlers in history, earning more money from their records which for a short time were top 10 on the pop charts. That era, which came when Jaguar Yokota ruled the roost as singles champion, was unique because the work rate of the women was mind-blowing based on the standards of the time. The top five women wrestlers of that era were better than the men, although that was considered something of an unspoken secret, as women's wrestling was geared toward teenage girls, and the fans who attended men's offices wouldn't have been caught dead at a show. In many cases the audience they were playing to didn't even realize just how incredible the work rate they were seeing was. 
but it was a huge success, drawing 15 plus ratings on Fuji Network for weekday afternoon broadcasts and spawned such legendary creatures as Dump Matsumoto, who survived as a B level game show celebrity for nearly a decade after her wrestling career had ended. The latest boom period came in the mid 90s, a comeback that started in 1990 when the women's office was surviving but at a low point, and began sending wrestlers to work undercard on big men's shows. The male fans, Seeing the new generation of stars like Monsters Bull Nakano, Asia Kong, and Bison Kimura, along with teenage flyers Minami Toyota and Tashio Yamada, Gutsi Akira Hokuto, now the wife of New Japan wrestler Kensuke Sasaki, and beauty queen Takako Inoue, basically had to acknowledge with their own eyes that they were some of, if not the best wrestlers in the game. The secondary women's promotion started to share somewhat in the boom and it wasn't long before most of the women's shows at Small Karakuen Hall were selling out and new offices were being created, Male fans began attending the AJW shows which concentrated more on work rate, largely dropping the singing, and the teenage girl psychosexual drama aspect slowly faded out. The biggest year was 1994, but it was capped off on November 20, 1995 when 42,500 fans attended the biggest women's wrestling event of all time at the Tokyo Dome. But as a long-term message, the plight of AJW is one that faces many offices at one time or another, and lessons that often aren't heated as companies doing remarkable business fail to see the big picture and create the new stars during the peak, rather than waiting too long and the new stars become the forgotten generation. It was really the crush gal period that was the most important, because on those days literally thousands of women per year dreamed of following in Chigusa's footsteps and becoming a pro wrestler. With thousands trying, only the athletic cream of the crop could make it, and it was those years that produced Hokuto, Toyota, Kong, Kimura, Inoue, and the rest. While the 90s period actually had better wrestling, with less interest among teenage girls, they didn't spawn anywhere near the same levels of interest in girls becoming pro wrestlers, so there was basically no next-generation superstars and the business has survived with the same headliners, all older and more banged up from the physical style with no real superstars created by any company since the 1995 Dome Show and big stars from that era regularly retiring with no replacements in sight, and very limited television to create new idols. The AJW office went bankrupt, and wrestlers left after going months without a paycheck. The company still survived with a smaller crew and on a cash basis, and in recent months, the TV show on Fuji Network has made a comeback doing remarkable ratings in the post-midnight time slot, causing some optimism that the down period was over. But the curiosity overseeing the Toyota vs. Kondori matchup, or seeing women in shoot fights on the L1 show, which drew good ratings, hasn't translated into either the creation of new drawing cards or picking up in live attendance. Complete results of the show saw 1. Zap Isozaki, AJW, and Chicago Shiratori, JWP, beat Sachi Nishibori, IWA, and Yuki Lee, JWP, when Isozaki pinned Nishibori. 2. Ri Tamada Urjan and Mika Akino Urjan beat Momoe Nakanishi, AJW, and Miyuki Fuji, AJW, when Tamada pinned Fuji in 727. It was really interesting seeing Nakani Shi, a small 19-year-old who is considered AJW's best worker for the future, be on the losing team on the big show in a very short second match of the night. 3. A mixed match with teams composed of two men, one woman and one midget, all from mixed offices, saw Alexander Otsuka of Battlers, perhaps the hottest indie wrestler in Japan right now, team with soon-to-be retired Yone Jinjin of Michinoku Pro, JWP's Kanako Matoya and AJW veteran midget Little Frankie to beat Yuki Ishikawa of Battlers, Brandon Iwa of Michinoku, Emi Motokawa of IWA and AJW midget Tomzo Tsunakake in 1149 when Frankie pinned Tsunakake. 4. Nani Takahashi, AJW, and Tomoko Kuzumi, JWP, beat Tomoko Miguchi, JWP, and Rieko Amano JWP, in 1534 when Kuzumi pinned Miyaguchi. 5. In the first win of the night for the AJW office, Miho Wakazawa and Keo Nomi captured the company's own all-Japan tag team titles beating the JD combination of Sumi Sakai and Yuko Kasugi in 1145. 6. Yasha Kuranai of LLPW captured the company's number two singles belt, the All-Pacific title, beating AJW's Kumiko Makawa in 1629 using the Kuranai suplex, 7. Kondori, LLPW, and Harley Saito, LLPW, beat Takako Inoue, AJW, and Norio Tadano, LLPW, in 1527 when Kondori made Inoue submit to a knee called Kondori Special 2. 8. In a battle of the top Violent Hill tag teams in Japan, the LLPW team of Shark Tsuchiya and Eagle Sawai beat AJW Zaps INT Kaoru Ito and Tomoko Watanabe, 
in 1038 when Sawai pinned I with a cannonball splash. 9. In the Legends of Wrestling match, the soon-to-be-retired Jaguar Yokota, JD, and Devil Masami, JWP, and Linus Asuka, JD, went to a 30-minute straw against Yumiko Hana, AJW, and Asia Kong version, and Dynamite Kansai, JWP, in a match involving six former holders of the red belt. During this match Kansai suffered a concussion taking a bump on her head and was out cold in the middle of the ring to where it was momentarily scary. She was taken to the hospital after the match and will have to take a few days off. 10. Nagayo Jia, retained her awe title beating Toyota in 1442 with the Octopus submission. A household name from the days of pro wrestling on network television in England, Giant Haystacks, passed away on November 23rd at his home in Prestwich, England after a lengthy battle with stomach cancer. His age has been reported by various sources as either being 50 or 55. Originally known as Luke McMaster's, real name Martin Ruane, Haystacks, billed at 6 foot 11 and 650 pounds, became the British equivalent to Haystacks Calhoun, one of American wrestling biggest attractions in the 1960s and early 1970s, with the same type of gimmick and facial appearance, but a much taller version. Through his 1970s feud with Big Daddy, became someone known well past the pro wrestling inner circle in the United Kingdom, and his death received tremendous mainstream press. Haystacks wrestled virtually his entire career in England, but did have a 1996 stint in World Championship Wrestling under the name Loch Ness, and as a trivia note, was Dynamite Kid's first tag team championship partner in North America during a 1980 tour with Stampede Wrestling where they feuded with Brett and Keith Hart. He also worked one tour with All Japan in 1985, brought in as a foreign monster to feud with Giant Baba, but once they actually saw him work, they nixed the idea of doing anything with him. Big Daddy, who passed away a few years ago, and Giant Haystacks, the two fat behemoths captured the British public's imagination as weekend afternoon fair on television which at its peak drew 20 million viewers, or about double the audience of Nitro and Raw combined. However, many also credit the two, who were poor workers, of being responsible for eventually killing interest in British wrestling as they continued to be focused on long past both of their primes and new talent and better working talent wasn't pushed, this seems to be a common theme of one-time successful companies. Eventually wrestling, appealing to an older and older audience by not marketing young stars, was pulled off British television and the business faded almost underground, with interest resurfacing behind guys like British Bulldog, Bret Hart and Undertaker when the WWF caught fire on television several years later. In reality, Ruane was closer to 6 foot 7, although his weight peaked out at 670 to 700 pounds, and he was close to 700 when he came to the United States as Loch Ness to be a major opponent as a giant foreign monster for Hulk Hogan and for whatever reason. Those in the office were led to believe he was this incredible Vader-like worker, and jaws dropped literally when he did his first Nitro angle. He never made it to Hogan on pay-per-view, and instead was fed to the giant in a classic poor match. He may have been already suffering from cancer at the time, but due to his weight, he had no ability or agility. He was originally scheduled to come to WCW several years earlier as the Titan, a name to spoof Titan Sports, as a huge guy to job for Lex Luger, but due to his wife taking ill, he never came. His fight with cancer generated a lot of publicity in England, and in recent years his weight had fallen to 350 pounds. When the Pancrase organization runs its December 19th Japanese pay-per-view from 7,000-seat Tokyo Bay NK Hall, there will be a different twist since the show will include three Valley Tudo rules matches. When Pancrase introduced actual competitive matches and a set of shooting rules to pro wrestling in 1993, derived from the worked shooting UWS-style pro wrestling offices of the 1980s, the specific intent was to have competitive non-predetermined matches, but within a safe sport-like framework. It had its original flaws, the fact that with the guys relatively new to actual shooting, like with the early USC matches, most of the matches were very short and spectacular. The first show contained something like 11 minutes of actual wrestling in six matches. Although well-received, the feeling was the sport couldn't continue as a financially viable one with a night full of one-minute matches. That's where the occasional works, spots, guys putting other guys over for business reasons and rule changes such as banning hill hooks because the injury rate was getting out of control, seeped in. The thought process in those early days is that Valley Tudo, which existed as something of an underground sport in Brazil, with very few rules, was uncivilized fighting as opposed to a sporting contest, a belief system largely held in the Pancrase organization when UFC gained worldwide popularity and Ken Shamrock, who was one of the founders of Pancrase, became that group's biggest star. 
even when rings introduced legitimate Valley Tudo rules matches to pro wrestling a few years back, Pancre stuck to its rules. UFC in its heyday when the purses were a lot higher, was very interested in using Masakatsu Fanaki and Minoru Suzuki in its tournaments, but the Japanese considered UFC as not a sports-like environment and even though most felt because they were so much farther advanced skill-wise than most of what UFC had in those days, that they would have done very well. Five years in this world is a complete generation, as the original stars of Pancrase, created within the pro wrestling world as former New Japan wrestlers, are burned out or in the process of doing so because in real shooting one only has a finite time at the top. Like other companies in trouble, the ones who have succeeded them don't have the charisma of the originals. And many of the later stars Pancrase created who had no experience in traditional pro wrestling, have left for greener pastures. This has led to interest in the game dropping from the early days when Pancrase shows could sell out mid-sized arenas and nearly packed big arenas for major events. The other problem as discussed many times, is that when the quality of fighters increases, the cool finishing submissions and knockouts that made the sport, happen with less and less frequency. Pancrase has turned into, to the detriment of spectators, into shows featuring evenly matched 180-pound guys maneuvering on the mat looking for submissions that usually aren't there to be had, before the time limit expires and it goes to the judges. This style of matches shows how much the sport has evolved and that the overall quality and skill level is far higher than in its infancy, but it is also is a harder sport to create new superstars and for mainstream fan appeal. Those who have competed in both Pancrase and Valley Tudo or UFC say that Pancrase is physically harder on the body, joints in particular, because it's largely trying to do maneuvers that attack the foundation of the joints, and because there are few easy fights, but it's more of a game with less chance of being brutally pummeled whereas Valley Tudo is more about going into a physical war. So as its own form of a pro wrestling gimmick match, Pancrase will be promoting three no-rules matches on its next pay-per-view event Masakatsu Funaki's Valley Tudo debut against unheralded John Rankin from Peoria, Illinois, Jeremy Horn, 9-4-2 and two including 0-2 in UFC competition, against Keiichiro Yamamiya, and John LeBay, 3-2-1, against charismatic rookie Kengo Watanabe. Horn and LeBay both lost earlier this year when challenging UFC middleweight champion Frank Shamrock, a Pancras alum. The Funaki match will have a 30 minutes time limit while the other two matches will have 15 minutes time limits and if the match goes the time limit, it's a draw as there are no judges for these matches. As mentioned last week, this puts Funaki in particular in a no-win situation. Rankin is unheralded and unless Funaki, who is 29, wins via knockout or submission, it'll be viewed as something of a disappointment. Due to all the poundings of five years of Pancrase and eight years of pro wrestling before that, he's passed his fighting prime and hasn't looked particularly good in his last several matches. The rules of this no-rules series of matches that will be fought inside the Pancrase ring are no attacking the groin or eyes, and no hair pulling or trunks pulling or holding the ropes to steady balance, along with no kicking if shoes are worn. It appears by the rules announced that headbutts and kicking on the ground, if barefooted, are both legal tactics. The other Pancrase rules matches on the show have Guy Mesger defending the King of Pancrase title against Yuki Kondo, ranking matches with Rishi Yanagisawa vs. Evan Tanner and Asami Shibuya vs. Minoru Suzuki, plus prelims with Jason Delusha vs. Manamu Yamada and Daisuke Ishii against Takata Dojo student Minoru Toyonaga which at least up to this point is the extent of the Takata team vs. Pancrase interpromotional deal has gone. Major Show 4 Star Matches Singles and tags combined 7, Jushin Liger, Koji Kanemoto. 6, Shinjiro Atani. 5, Kenta Kobashi. 4, Mitsuharu Misawa, Toshiaki Kawada, Genichiro Tenryu, Tatsuhito Takaiwa. 3, Shinya Hashimoto, Mick Foley, Masato Tanaka, Kyoshi Tamura, Shiro Koshinaka, Dr. Wagner Jr., Kendo Kashin. Notes, this isn't meant to be any kind of a conclusive rating about people ability or work rate but it does give a pretty good indication of how wrestlers have performed in big matches this year. Wrestlers are limited by their spots on the card and how much time they are allotted, and even more so, by the quality of their opposition. If you look at the two most dominant top guys of the year who were also generally world champions, Austin and Misawa, you'll see an example of this. Misawa, who was badly injured most of this year still will finish the year with better than a four-star average and possibly is the number one wrestler in the world by this system. Considering everything, that's amazing. But Misawa, as the Budokan headliner, is given opportunity for longer matches than wrestlers from other companies, which can be a blessing or a curse as the vast majority of wrestlers will have better matches going less than 15 minutes than having to go 25 to 45 like Misawa. But he's better at long matches and gets to do them, and the quality of his singles opponents are second to none. 
a wrestler like Chris Benoit is night after night a better wrestler than Misawa, but the quality of his opposition, while not bad, isn't at the same level. The New Japan Junior heavyweights who dominate in both singles and tags are all great workers and on big shows they always work with each other so they aren't taken down by having matches with bad opponents. Austin, who has battled back from his share of injuries, is probably on a nightly basis a better worker than Misawa, who pretty much saves himself for the big show. In Austin's case, early in the year he appeared to be benefiting because he was matched a few times with Foley, who was a fantastic opponent for him. As the year went on the odds started working against him with so many matches with the likes of Undertaker, Bossman, and Kane. More than anyone Kiyoshi Tamura is victimized because his working matches this year except when matches with Yamamoto, Mikhail, and Kosaka, have been with exceedingly poor workers and his style is so totally limiting in that he can't do any showy moves that aren't legitimate, he's still top 20 which may actually be confirmation he's one of, if not the, best worker in the game today. Clearly Genichiro Tenryu is nowhere near being a top 5 worker. He has an ability to bring out the best in an opponent with a lot of fire, but still, those matches were totally made by his opponents. Conversely, the best worker of late in WCW and WWF have been Juventud Guerrera and X-Pac, and neither finished that highly because they're big show matches for whatever reason, usually their opponents and Guerrero had a pay-per-view singles match this year with Ron Race, haven't ranked at the level of their TV matches. Still, these in more cases than not these are a fair representation of the caliber of matches these wrestlers have had this year, and of the kind of year they've had in comparison to years of the past and an improvement and decline in the ring. The tag team rankings show just how much the old regular tag team philosophy has gone out the window when there are only 14 teams that have been together for three major show matches. Mexico. There is a lot of news expected to be breaking, both in and out of the ring, over the next few weeks as Mexico enters its biggest period of the year. Due to the connection with WCW, Arena Mexico has added a December 18th date for its season ender, and has made the next three Fridays all into Christmas spectaculars with photo ops for fans and with Salomon Grundy and Brasso de Plata both dressing up as Santa Claus to take photos with kids. Vampiro, Dandy and Hector Garza all return on December 4th as part of a tournament for the CMLL Trio's titles. They are returning billed as the WCW team, and face Zumbido and Bestia Salvaje and Scorpio Jr. in one first-round match while the other first-round match has Mr. Niebla and Shocker and Rio de Jalisco Jr. vs. Apollo Dantes and Fuerza Guerrera and Gran Marcus Jr. with the winners meeting later in the show. Another four teams will complete on December 11th, and the winner of the December 4th and December 11th tournament meet for the titles on December 18th. The top two matches on the card will be a non-stipulation singles match with Mascara Año 2000 vs. Pierroth Jr. and an NWA light heavyweight title match with Black Warrior defending against Felino. It is expected that both Conan and Sonny Ono from WCW will appear on the December 11th show to shoot the big WCW vs. EMLL angle. Ono may also be there on December 4th although I'm not certain of that, and there is also talk of J.J. Dillon coming in for the December 11th show. The situation with El Hijo del Santo and Negro Casas continues to be one of controversy. Paco Alonso continues to assure WCW that neither had signed with WWF but he had also talked of their appearance at the Super Astros tapings in Texas as a one-time thing. However, both Santo and Casas were again at the WWF tapings in Philadelphia, Baltimore and New Haven this week. Super Luchas reported this past week that Victor Quinones of the WWF has been in touch with former UA promoter Carlos Mainz, who was one of the major promoters in the world during the 80s but whose company went out of business largely when AAA caught fire in Mexico and he began losing his talent to both warring companies that had better television exposure and Pablo Canedo, a powerful man in the Televisa organization, the number one network in the country that already airs both AAA and EMLL, about doing a television-only promotion starting in 1999. This has led to belief that Santo and Casas, the top draws for EMLL, would be the cornerstone of the new group along with other wrestlers that WWF would sign, although Santo, Casas and Dantes are all still working for EMLL. Canedo was the power behind the October 24th War of Nations Asesa show airing in prime time at 7pm on Televisa on November 28th. Speaking of that show, this is how the Brasso de Plata shoot deal was described by someone who saw the show. Basically there was miscommunication and no selling spots deriving from that. American Destroyer, who was unmasked by Pierre Roth Jr. in a hair versus mask match recently in Nuevo Laredo as former WCW jobber Eddie Jackie, who wrestled in Puerto Rico as Perfect 10, got into it with Plata punching him three times and Destroyer throwing two kicks to the groin area. One of Jackie's teammates, Born Killer, got into it with Plata and Plata basically kicked the hell out of him. 
Plata and another of their partners, Ricky Banderas, got into stances like boxers and looked like they were going to go at it but were broken up, and then Born Killer came back in and Plata kicked him hard in the ribs. Yoshihiro Tajiri looked great working with Negro Casas. Tajiri teamed with Magnum Tokyo, and it said Tajiri completely outclassed Magnum. Black Magic and Silver King should also be back within the next few weeks and Villano V was actually the first WCW wrestler to return, although it was unannounced for a singles match where he replaced his injured brother Villano Tercero losing to Emilio Charles Jr. on November 24th at Arena Coliseo. At the November 27th Arena Mexico show, the main event saw Los Hermanos Dinamita beat Pierroth Jr. and Marcus Jr. and Fuerza Guerrera in straight falls when Cien Caras and Mascara Año 2000 gave Pierroth and Guerrera simultaneous low blows behind the ref's back. The match with the most heat saw Felino and Santo and Casas beat Scorpio Jr. and Bestia Salvaje in Black Warrior when Felino pinned Warrior to set up the title match. A lot of the Arena Mexico EMLL regulars are mad because they see the WCW guys coming in and taking their top spots, since all the WCW guys with a few exceptions are guys who left EMLL and the wrestlers that remain believe they should be rewarded for their loyalty. This creates a situation where any wrestlers not under WCW contract are open to WWF contract, which may lead to the Quinones promotion attracting a lot of EMLL talent. Paco Alonso had a meeting with talent with all the rumors flying and said that business hasn't been good and this angle will pick business up and he needs to bring back the guys who left to get the angle over. Musco Delamar said and super crazy, if he hasn't signed with WWF, right now he's on a tour of Germany, are expected to also be brought back to EMLL for the feud. December 13th War of Titans show has been moved from now Kalpan to Chihuahua. They'll have a press conference this week to announce the lineup. Actor Guicho Dominguez was back working an angle on the November 23rd baseball stadium show in Huevo Laredo. Triple A got a ton of mainstream press for their float in the November 20th National Sports Parade because Dominguez was on the float. In Tijuana at Auditorio Municipal over the past 12 months, there were 60 shows. The commission filed a report stating that overall wrestling attendance and revenue increased over 1997, and that both boxing and kickboxing shows at the Auditorio also increased in business over the past year. In the main event on November 29th in now Kalpan for ESPN International Taping, Team Japan, Yoshikazu Taru of War, Kanda, Masaki Mochizuki of War RI, Shima Nobunaga, Judo Suwa and Sumo Fuji, beat the Mexican-slash-Central American team, Cato Kung Lee Jr. and Sr., Dr. Cerebro, IWRG Mr. Niebla, Rafael Salcero, Maniac Cop and America, in an elimination match. Niebla and Cato Sr. were the last two on Team Mexico, and they ended up fighting with each other and brawling into the stands and were both counted out, which sets the two up for a match for Niebla's IC middleweight title on December 6. Salcero gave his notice before the show started and he's jumping to CMLL, this came just a week or two after CMLL swore that any wrestler working in IWRG taping wouldn't be welcome in their company. December 2nd at La Carpa Astros Arena in Mexico City has El Satanico defending the CMLL middleweight title against Casas. Women wrestler Tanya quit CMLL after losing her hair match on November 15th to Lady Apache. When they had the big celebration for Lady Apache for winning, Tanya because of all the commotion, got away without much of her hair being cut. Panico, the agent, went nuts on her backstage about leaving without her hair being cut. She claimed she was just getting heat by leaving and would come back out, but then left the building. When she showed up the next day with most of her hair to get her paycheck, her hair bonus was missing from the check. She was furious and stormed out, then shaved her head and came back to get her bonus. Panico then told her too little, too late and removed her from all the bookings for the week. She then quit the company. Benjamin Mora ran a show on November 27th in Tijuana with Mil Mascaras and Brasso de Plata and Tinieblas Jr. vs. Villano Tercero and Rey Mysterio and Pirata Morgan plus Mascara de Sagrada, WWF Mini Nova, defending the WWA Mini's title against the original Octagon Cheeto, who also is under a WWF contract. All Japan at press time, the tag team tournament on December 5th at Budokan Hall looks to be coming down to Vader and Stan Hansen meeting with winner of the December 2nd match in Kumamoto between Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tatwe vs. Kenna Kobashi and Jun Akiyama. As of December 1st, the standings saw Vader and Hansen 6-0, Kawada and Tawe 4-1, Kawada and Tawe 4-1, Johnny Ace and Bart Gunn 4-2, Kobashi and Akiyama 2-1-1, Mitsuharu Misawa and Yoshinari Ogawa 1-3-1, Headhunters 1 and 4. Yoshihiro Takayama and Takao Amori 1 and 4 and Gary Albright and Giant Kimala 2 1 and 5. The first tour of 1999 will be from January 2nd to January 22nd, 
so the tour is one week shorter than is traditional, with the big show on the tour before the final night at Osaka Furitsu Gym. The first Budokan show will be three-sixths. Giant Baba will be going to the WWF pay-per-view show in Vancouver on December 13th to get a look at the various talent and see if there are any wrestlers he's unfamiliar with who he'd be able to bring in next year after Vader and Bart Gunn both got over so well. Tournament results for the week saw November 26th in Utsunomiya drew 1,050 as Vader and Hansen beat Takayama and Amori in 857 when Vader squashed Takayama and Kobashi and Akiyama beat Kimala 2 and Albright. November 27th in Morioka before a sellout 3,250 saw Takayama and Amori beat Albright and Kimala 2 in 12.25 when Takayama made Kimala 2 submit to the armbar and Tawei and Kaoda handed Ace and Gun their first loss when Kaoda pinned Ace in 17.55 with a jumping high kick. November 28th in Yamagata before 3,400 saw Ace and Gun over Headhunters when Gun pinned A in 12.29 and November 30th in Sendai before a sellout 3,550 saw Masawa and Ogawa go to a 30 minutes draw with Kobashi and Akiyama and Hansen and Vader beat Ace and Gun in 12.33 when Vader pinned Gun. The November 15th TV show which was the 45-minute opening of the Tag Tourney special drew a 2.6 rating, which is nothing special. New Japan Osamu Nishimura is still out of action with testicular cancer. Things remain largely in a state of disorganization leading up to the December 30th UFO show in Osaka and the January 4th Tokyo Dome show as no matches were officially announced for either show this week other than Atsushi Onita vs. Kensuke Sasaki for the Dome show. The basic storyline is that Onita has to first beat Sasaki to get a match with Riki Choshu later in the year. While on the surface the way these feuds are booked, it would seem since the angle and all the magazine covers this week had Choshu fighting Onita, that Onita would get the first win to build up the Legends match. However, while the magazines are playing the feud up big, the public response to this point has been a huge disappointment and Dome tickets aren't selling. They are supposed to have a press conference this week to announce the Dome show. In the New Japan vs. UFO matches from the Dome, the way the story goes is that Antonio Inoki will send three wrestlers, not five none of whom he's announced although the belief is it'll be Don Fry, Naoya Ogawa and Brian Johnston and that New Japan's three guys will be Shinya Hashimoto, Kazuo Yamazaki, and Yuji Nagata. If UFO sends two more guys, then New Japan would add Kazuyuki Fujita and Akitoshi Saito to the team. The reason those wrestlers were picked is because they are trying to get this program over as a shoot, and it's too soon as we've discussed, so New Japan is sending the guys with shooter reps as opposed to its biggest name workers to fight the other shooters. While not officially announced, the plan at this point for December 30th in Osaka is to put Ogawa against Mike Sadello, not sure of the last name, a 38-year-old American pro boxer who is said to have held the WBO cruiserweight title in 1989 and 1993 and has competed as a heavyweight since 1994. Inichiro Tenryu also sent a challenge to Ogawa and said that he wanted to defend his Japanese heavyweight title belt against him. The idea of a pro wrestler facing someone from another sport was a huge draw in Inoki's day, and he used some guys who were legit and gave fake credentials and made names out of others, but that idea has been done so much now that it's no longer a novelty, particularly when everyone knows that a one-dimensional boxer can't beat a real submission wrestler unless he gets the first shot in before the takedown, which was more of a mystery in Inoki's day which is how he became legendary. Tag tourney standings as of December 1st were, Kensuke Sasaki and Kazuo Yamazaki 3-0, Yuji Nagata and Manabu Nakanishi 3-1, Genichiro Tenryu and Shiro Koshinaka 3-1, Keiji Muto and Satoshi Kojima 2-2, two two, Tatsumi Fujinami and Shinya Hashimoto 2-2, two two, Hiroyoshi Tenzan and NWO Sting 2-3 and, and David Finley and Jerry Flynn 0-4. Finals are December 6th in Nagoya. This week saw, November 25th at Tokyo Karakuen Hall before a sellout 1,811 saw Sasaki and Yamazaki beat Flynn and Finley in 834 and Mudo and Kojima beat NWO Sting and Tenzan in 1935, November 26th in Suruoka before 2,200 saw Sasaki and Yamazaki beat Fujinami and Hashimoto when Yamazaki made Hashimoto submit to the armbar. November 27th in Yanezawa before 2,300 saw Tenzan and NWO Sting beat Flynn and Finley, November 28th in Kogawa before 1,500 saw Tenzan and Sting beat Nakanishi and Nagata when Tenzan pinned Nakanishi in 1324, and November 29th in Fujisawa before 4,000 Mudo and Kojima over Hashimoto and Fujinami when Mudo pinned Fujinami with a Frankensteiner in 1221. Rivals Tenzan and Kojima teamed together for the first time on the November 26th show beating Nagata and Nakanishi in the main event. After the tour ends Mudo will be returning to the United States, 
going to Minnesota for shots and treatment for his chronically bad knees. November 14th TV did a 2.1 rating. Other Japan notes. Kuri Suzuki's final match will be December 27th at Karakuen Hall against Dynamite Kansai. Pankrace ran on November 29th in Osaka before only 850 fans with a series of matches literally picked just as the show started, which was the gimmick that the Tokyo team and the Yokohama team would each pick five guys and they'd draw matches at ringside when the show started. Judging from the attendance, that isn't a very marketable gimmick. In an upset, Ikuiza Minoa beat Satoshi Hasegawa with an armlock in 243. The final match saw Katsomi Inagaki beat much-heralded rookie Kengo Watanabe, whose record fell to 0-3 leading up to his December 19th match against John LeBay. Watanabe after the match said he'd been training for no holds barred and his head wasn't into the match. On the IWA show on November 29th at Karakuen Hall, they held a tag match where the winner of the match, who turned out to be Katsumi Hirano, would challenge Doug Gilbert for their world title. Gilbert won the match when a wrestler in a leatherface mask hit the ring with a chainsaw and attacked him. He unmasked as Tarzan Goto to start a new feud. Here and there. The November 21st replay of the NBC Secrets of Pro Wrestling special only drew a 4.8 rating, which is miserable for network prime time. For whatever this is worth, this miserable rating for a rerun on network prime time still drew more viewers than any edition of Raw or Nitro has ever drawn in its history. A correction from last week's issue where we stated that Rocco Valentino who appeared on the World Legion Wrestling TV tapings appeared on the NBC special. It was actually a wrestler from the same promotion who wrestles as Vinny Valentino. Not sure if they are doing a relative's gimmick, that was the one on the NBC special. The November 30th ESPN magazine had a short feature on Jesse Ventura. Speaking of Jesse, here is the latest on his Navy SEAL background controversy. When interviewed this past week on details of his service in the Navy SEALs, Ventura said that it's nobody's business. When asked if he served in Vietnam, he said that it's nobody's business. And when asked what he did in the Navy SEALs, he said that his commander told him to not talk about it so he isn't going to. The New York Daily News ran a huge two-page story on superstar Billy Graham. It talked a lot about his various ailments and his religious background. Graham was very complimentary to Jesse Ventura and talked about first meeting him. When asked about Ventura and steroids, Graham said that Ventura wasn't big into them. He talked about first meeting and befriending Hogan in Florida. When asked about Hogan and steroids, Graham said that Hogan did a ton. When asked about today's WWF, Graham said, the vulgarity, the characterizations, the message they're sending now. It's too far out there. Too far gone, he said that he wrote letters to both Hogan and Vince McMahon apologizing for going after them so strongly in 1992 when he dropped his lawsuit against McMahon, Actually the lawsuit was thrown out of court due to the statute of limitations having run out before it was filed when testimony revealed that Graham had been told by his doctor that his health problems were related to his steroid use too many years before the filing of the lawsuit. Graham said he still would have taken the steroids even if there was no Dr. George Saurian as he would have found a doctor on his own. Thanks to Brian Smith in Connecticut for the review of the Observer book tributes and of the Observer itself in his recent pro wrestling column. It was pretty cool to see a reviewer who actually got the message of the book. On the November 28th Memphis Power Pro TV show, Baldo and Vic Grimes beat Bulldog Reigns and Streak in a match that saw Grimes do a running dive over the top into a somersault sent on onto Reigns to set up the pin. Grimes looks to be weighing right now around 390 pounds. Fatu is headed in. Jerry Lawler and Stacy did an interview talking about filming the final scenes of Man in the Moon with Jim Carrey and David Letterman doing a reprise of Lawler and Kaufman's work confrontation on a 1982 Letterman show. Funny how the news story that went everywhere about all of Lawler's scenes in that movie being erased has been forgotten after their much publicized angle or however you want to describe Carrey's publicity stunt. Lawler was praising just how professional Carrey was to work with when Sean Stasia came out and started hitting on Stacy, who didn't act interested. Later in the dressing room they showed a scene of Lawler out on the floor and Stacy having disappeared. Lawler when he recovered started freaking out looking for Stacy. Kid Wicked regained the Young Guns title beating Aaron O'Grady in what was described as a great match. Later in the show Lawler found Stacy's clothes but couldn't find her. They had a scene where the lights went out and when they came on, Randy Hales was handcuffed to the ring post. Tony Falk had a key, and for unlocking Hales, Hales allowed him back into the syndicate the heel group with Grimes and Baldo. 
Later in the show Stasiak took a camera crew up to a loft where Stacy was tied in a chair wearing nothing but her underwear. Stasiak went to kiss her but her knight in aged armor, Lawler, made the save. Grimes and Baldo jumped Lawler but Streak made the save. Some notes on the WWF trainees after watching some tapes. Bloom, who is being groomed to do a Son of George Steel gimmick, is a huge guy. Like 6 foot 7 and 370 who isn't all that fat. He reminds me a lot of Charles Wright, Godfather, when he first broke in. He has all the charisma of Brian Adams, and roughly the same work rate. Translated, while he's not terrible, unless his gimmick hits big. He's exactly the kind of wrestler that Titan doesn't need, because he doesn't have charisma. He makes the giant guys look less physically impressive and the medium-sized guys look like midgets. Grimes is a lot shorter, although heavier and I'm familiar with him from California. He's way too heavy, but he is strong on interviews and charisma. When Baldo and Grimes are together, even though Baldo is like 7 inches taller, all your attention naturally goes to Grimes. Stasiak is a tall pretty boy guy who would have to be a heel today with a pretty cut of bodybuilder physique and a decent interview. O'Grady is by far the best technical worker of the bunch, but also the smallest at about 5 foot 7, 180, which means Kid Wicked must be a midget because he looks very short even next to O'Grady. In a company that can't get Takamichi Noku over, who is a much better worker, or Brian Christopher over, who has far more charisma, he's in for an uphill struggle at best. The Music City Wrestling Thanksgiving show drew just 250 fans ending when Brickhouse Brown and Flash Flanagan beat Stephen Dunn and Reno Riggins when a wrestler in a wolf mask, apparently supposed to be Wolfie D, hit Riggins with a hubcap. This sets up a fans bring weapons match with Flanagan and D versus Dunn and Riggins on December 5th. The November 27th and November 28th house shows were then cancelled. There were several no-shows on the Thanksgiving card. Gypsy Joe missed the event and instead wrestled that night for a local promotion and MCW claimed he never contacted them and told them he wasn't coming. Chad Collier and Candy Devine both notified the company in advance in time for MCW to change the card. MCW has talked with the Nashville Network about getting the proposed 8 p.m. Friday night time slot and is trying to get a letter, fax, email, etc. campaign to the network similar to the success ECW has had at various times, rallying its fans together. Right now Nashville Network has no deal with anyone but people close to the negotiations say that the way things are structured, too many people already have a cut in the pie and at this point taking the deal under the terms outlined would end up costing more than it's worth. ECW has been in negotiations with them as well and those negotiations are still ongoing, as have several people including Paul Alperstein of the defunct AWF Yokozuna showed up as a guest on an indie show over the weekend in Palmdale, California weighing an estimated 600 pounds, he was supposed to do a run-in and do his bonsai, but said his back was in really bad shape and instead delivered a few clotheslines. How's this for weird booking? For New Dimension Wrestling, Tully Blanchard won the NDW title on November 26 in Bluefield, West Virginia beating Ricky Nelson. He was then stripped of the title over the 30-day rule, since he wasn't booked on any more NDW shows, and the title was returned to Nelson. On that same show, Ricky Morton who is teaming with David Jericho in the Carolinas as the new Rock and Roll Express, claimed that Jericho was actually his son, not true, using the Jericho name because he didn't want to make it on his father's reputation. Chris Dundee, 91, a longtime pro wrestling and boxing promoter in Miami Beach, passed away on November 17. Dundee was the promoter of Wednesday night shows at the Miami Beach Convention Center every Wednesday night, during the heyday of championship wrestling from Florida. His was the brother of Angelo Dundee, the famed boxing manager of Muhammad Ali, there is also the report of a death of pro wrestler Abe Stanklin, 96, on November 23rd. He was a former carnival hooker known as Pig Grease Stanklin because he used to wrestle pigs at fairs. We have reports that the late Sky Lolo wrestled as late as 1988 while touring the maritime provinces of Canada for Emile Dupree's Grand Prix Wrestling. NWA will be running the Patapsco Arena in Baltimore that had been running the Axel Rotten Maryland Championship Wrestling shows before they lost the building. First show is December 12th with Sid. Bob Backlund, Mabel, Doug Gilbert, Stevie Richards, Tito Santana, and Pitbulls. Jake Roberts vs. Kurt Hennig plus Jim Brunzel, Villa Irwin and Charlie Norris headline a December 5th show in Maple Grove, Minnesota. A correction regarding NWA All-Star Wrestling and Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Page runs the NWA group and was involved with the Mid-Atlantic group but the latter group fired him so they are two different offices. Add Andre Roberts, a 340-pound legit Indian, to the list of UFC fighters who are dabbling in pro wrestling. Roberts, who is ranked number 19 in the world among heavyweights with a 6-0 record, 
including one win on a 1998 UFC show, worked an indie show on October 21st in Hayward, Wisconsin, beating Smile and Jack. The promoter of the show was Brad Kohler, who also worked the undercard. Kohler, who is a training partner at Times of X-Pac, has himself has done a lot of MMA including losing on the undercard of UFC Japan in 1997. Several wrestling personalities came to announcing tryouts for the new roller derby. Don't know much about how it went other than Missy Hyatt, Rick Rude, Danny Wolf, who was all over the Learning Channel special as the TV announcer and also the announcer in the NBC special wearing a mask, and Ken Resnick were among those trying out. The only thing I heard was Rude didn't get the spot, which it's hard to believe he'd be any good for since he wasn't good doing wrestling commentary and he was actually from that world. I believe the first television show will actually be taped this weekend in Orlando. MMA Here's the status of the January 8th show right now. The Boss Rutten vs. Tuyashi Kosaka, Pedro Rizzo vs. Mark Coleman and Townsend Saunders vs. Mikey Burnett matches are on. Evan Tanner vs. Daryl Golar, a former Greco-Roman champion with an 0-1 MMA record losing a match in Brazil by decision that most feel he was robbed in, in a middleweight match is a definite, as is a new match this week, Pat Militic defending the lightweight title against Brazilian Jorge Patino. Patino is listed as having a 20-3 record, although to this point UFC has been only able to verify his record as 11-3, but he's lost three of his last four fights in Brazil, one of which was in 30 seconds. With Allen goes out, it also leaves Jerry Bullender without an opponent. There has been talk of taking Bullender off this show and using him on March 5th as an opponent for Vitor Belfort and adding a completely new match to this show although all of this is in the discussion state. John Peretti suggested putting Bullender against Pancrase's Jason Godzi, a 230-pounder out of his weight class, which doesn't seem to serve any purpose other than potentially hurting the appeal of some future major middleweight fights if Bullender either loses or doesn't look impressive winning and hurts the entire idea of weight classes at a time when UFC, for better or for worse, needs to handle itself like traditional boxing for sanctioning and wider pay-per-view clearances. My suspicion is that Ken Shamrock will turn down the fight for Bolander and suggest Godzi instead face Pete Williams, who is about the same weight. Shamrock will be training the Lions' den team Burnett and or Williams or Bolander throughout December in San Diego for the show and will probably be in his team's corner in their fights. Shamrock is in the process of opening a lion's den in San Diego, grand opening to the public looks to be in February although people will actually be training in it starting this week, which would be the first martial arts facility that I know of in the world that will have its own practice octagon. At some point this may also turn into a pro wrestling training school as well and Ray Mysterio Jr., who lives in the same area, may be involved with a gym when it expands to pro wrestling. In the current hit movie, very bad things, the beginning of the movie where all the guys are going crazy doing lines with a stripper saw them have UFC tapes on the big screen in the background, and you can see the Ken Shamrock vs. Brian Johnston match. Shooto on November 27th at Karaku and Hall saw two USWF champions appear in top matches. Eric Payne, who holds the lightweight title, lost to Uchu Tatsumi via choke in the first round, while light heavyweight champ Paul Jones, remained unbeaten with a decision win over Sanai Kikuta best known for lasting 52 minutes before losing to Henzo Gracie in 1997 at the Tokyo Dome. At the show, Shudo heavyweight champ Ensign Inoue, coming off the win over Randy Couture, said that he would be having a submission rules match against Mario Sperry in late February in Abu Dhabi. The Extreme Challenge promotion is looking at running a big show in April at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis. In a letter to Full Contact Fighter, Jeff Blatnick admitted there were problems with the show in Brazil, and said that he thought Semaphore Entertainment Group shouldn't do another show there until they were rectified. The problems noted were a lack of security barricade and backstage security allowing people to rush to Octagon side and go backstage. While there were no problems and people who were there said the scene wasn't at all dangerous, Semaphore Entertainment Group was also fortunate in that regard that the Brazilian favorites, Rizzo and Belfort, won their matches. Blatnik admitted that the off-TV preliminary matches were held under Brazilian rules as opposed to MAC rules and that fines would be levied because of it, and that when going out of the country, Blatnik recommended and Bob Marowitz agreed to bring two doctors. In Brazil, there was Semaphore Entertainment Group's regular doctor, Dr. Richard Istrico of New York, and a Brazilian doctor, who spoke no English which meant Istrico had to both examine fighters after their fights and also be at ringside watching the fights. There was also a complaint that fighters weren't paid within seven working days of the show which goes against the MAC rules, but by the time that story broke, all fighters had been paid and checks had been cashed from the show. Just saw the October 28th K-1 show. A lot of quick and brutal knockouts including Nobuaki Kikuta, who was the ref for the K-1 show in Las Vegas, 
destroying former pro wrestler and martial arts legend Bart Vale in the first round. In our initial report there were people who believed the Andy Hug match on this show saw Masaki Miyamoto lay down for Hug in the first round, but after watching that fight, I wouldn't come to that conclusion at all. It was certainly not a worked match because nobody was taking anything off their blows which is the obvious work trait. Hug nailed him twice with spinning backfists, which is a home run type of blow that is hard to nail perfectly once, let alone twice in the same round, which is probably where suspicion was aroused. The blows landed hard, the second one was the finish and Miyamoto had a bad cut over the eye from it. ECW The pay-per-view show is a definite for the Millennium Theater in Kissimmee, Florida, near Orlando. There were plans last week to move it to either Lakeland or Miami, due to the Kissimmee location having a capacity of just 2,500 due to some changes as when they booked the place they thought it would hold 3,500, but after some negotiations, they got variances to allow them to put 3,175 in the building. Weekend show saw the November 27th TV taping in Fort Lauderdale drew a sellout 2000, November 28th in Tampa drew 885 and November 29th in Kissimmee, Florida drew 800. They did an angle in Kissimmee to lead to a ladder match on pay-per-view with Tommy Dreamer vs. Just Incredible. Highlights of the weekend were the Rob Van Dam vs. Jerry Lynn matches. By almost all accounts, Lynn has turned into the best worker in the promotion and he and Van Dam were moved into the main event slot and had great matches in both Tampa and Kissimmee. They were said to have been the best Van Dam matches since he's joined the company. Lynn suffered a bad head cut the first night when the two accidentally butted heads, Terry Funk did a surprise run-in at the Tampa House show and left Dreamer laying. Most likely they'll wrestle at the March pay-per-view show. The only matches definite at press time for the Tour of Japan with FMW were a December 12th Karakuen Hall match with Shane Douglas defending against Dreamer and a December 13th Karakuen Hall match with the Dudleys defending the tag titles against Sabu and Van Dam. There will probably also be a Douglas ECW title match against a Japanese wrestler and a December 12th match with Sabu and Van Dam vs. Dreamer and Hayabusa. Masato Tanaka is leaving after this coming weekend. There is still a possibility of his returning from January through June, but he's talked like he's now expecting to return to Japan permanently and that he would feud with Hayabusa in FMW as the headline feud. Wolf Hockfield worked Tampa and Kissimmee against Tommy Rogers getting mixed reviews. Most reports sounded more enthusiastic about him than Paul Heyman, who saw him as too similar to Mike Awesome and without the same talent and charisma. Fans didn't get into the match and heckled Hockfield by chanting Jim Steele at him. He may be brought in to put over Van Dam, who they are grooming to be their top star. But there are no serious plans for him at this point. Johnny Smith was also asked to come in but he's delayed it until after the new year because his wife is expecting. The Weekend TV Built around the angle where Taz dropped Sabu on his head and Sabu was taken out in an ambulance, although he didn't even miss one show from the angle, was probably the best storytelling ECW TV in a long time. They aired Van Dam vs. Rod Price, in edited form, just showing Van Dam's big moves, which looked hot. The explanation was that it was being taped for Japan, and they could only show highlights. What a cover reason. And they showed in edited form, Lynn vs. Lance Storm followed by Storm vs. Mikey Whipwreck. The former was edited down to 5 minutes, and looked awesome in edited form. The other match was edited down to about 40 seconds. They aired the Sabu and Van Dam vs. Taz and Douglas match where Sabu used a spike to bloody Douglas, and pinned him after an Arabian facebuster in 644. Douglas didn't look good at all. Taz did the injury angle, then acted like he felt guilty about it, then did an about face and attacked Sabu on the stretcher and did an interview gloating about it. Axel Rotten still hasn't had his gallbladder surgery. Expectations are he may work the pay-per-view show doing some sort of a gimmick match and have the surgery after the show. Douglas suffered a broken right wrist in Tampa in the match with Lance Storm. It was bleeding like crazy and needed stitches as well. He was put in a cast and actually wrestled the next night, although his match with Storm only went one minutes before all the run-ins came. Awesome was also at the show's off crutches, and talked about being back in action during the summer. On the other hand Jack Victory's leg is a mess and it'll be a long time, if ever, before he can return. The report about an ECW magazine coming out was incorrect. It was one of those rumors that got started and everyone talked about it, but the guy was traced back to admit it making it all up. Hack Myers worked in Fort Lauderdale teaming with Balls Mahoney and Tanaka losing to the Dudleys. Rex King also worked the undercards, they brought John Cronus in the first night but had Taz drop him on his head and he did a stretcher job. Cronus had challenged Douglas for the title when Sabu got behind him. 
Adult Video News had a story about porn star Rob Black trying to get into ECW. Black said he met with ECW hierarchy who told him his notoriety could stir up controversy to help them on pay-per-view. Black claimed in the article that the wrestling fan base already knows him because the wrestling demographic is the same one that buys Hustler and Screw. Black was willing to work for free as a way to get his name over and sell his own tapes. Black, who apparently doesn't have a good physique, says he plans to go into hard training and juice up if he needs to. WCW Hulk Hogan announced his retirement on The Tonight Show on November 26th and talked about running for president. Supposedly they had a pre-show agreement that Jay Leno would throw him nothing but softballs, and some in WCW felt Leno double-crossed them by actually making Hogan look silly like asking him if he's going to be a Republican or Democrat, right down the middle, brother, and if he has any issues. Flat tax, brother. After the latter comment, Leno asked him what the flat tax should be, and Hogan stuttered before coming up with 16%. When Leno asked him how he got that figure, he stuttered again and mumbled something about 16 being more than 15%. Good luck, brother. Leno asked him if he was going to come back and wrestle in a few weeks and Hogan, who played total babyface and while he never mentioned the names of any other wrestlers, he did at least once mention WCW, avoided that question. Hogan tried to bring up that he felt he owed WCW one last appearance, but before he could bring that up, Leno had changed the subject. They also showed clips from the match in Sturgis showing Leno with the arm twist on Hogan and Hogan selling. Hogan admitted his real name was Terry Balia and that his first wrestling name was Terry Boulder. He talked about Ventura winning and said that in wrestling Ventura was a little minnow while he was the big fish and said that whenever they wrestled, he always beat Ventura. He seemed like he was trying to bury Ventura a little as Ventura hasn't exactly been kind to Hogan when the subject comes up and was terribly unkind to him before Ventura became a folk hero. Hogan didn't think very well on his feet and looked bad on the show. Still, his retirement got a lot of mainstream coverage in CNN and ESPN as did his running for president. Nobody treated the retirement as a sham, nor brought up that he already did it in 1992. They strongly teased he'd retire after WrestleMania in the build-up to that show in the middle of all the fallout from his lying about steroids but he disappeared after the show but never himself, that he would retire other than was he'd give an answer at the show and then never gave an answer. In 1993, when his return wasn't the success everyone expected it to be and McMahon wanted to face him from the top and have him put over Bret Hart, and he lost to Yokozuna instead and left, although nobody is taking his running for president seriously. While Hogan Talk dominated the WCW Saturday Night Show, they brought it up early on Nitro and a few other times but at least it wasn't the constant focus of the TV show. Scott Hall had a mishap wrecking a rented 1999 Cadillac in Orange County, Florida, on November 25th. He fell asleep at the wheel and the car rolled over three times. He could have been seriously injured but he was wearing his seat belt and escaped with a bunch of cuts and bruises and his face was a little swollen on TV, but he wasn't even hospitalized. They took a breathalyzer and he wasn't intoxicated nor did he show any signs of impairment. It was covered by the same local newscast in Orlando that the week before ran a story on Dana Hall talking about Scott having drug and alcohol addictions. Well, at least we went a few weeks without a Scott Hall story. Scott Steiner tried to plead guilty last week on charges of aggravated assault and making terroristic threats in an incident on April 21st, but the judge wasn't satisfied with his story and the prosecution withdrew the plea bargaining agreement. According to a story in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the allegation is that Paul Kasparine, a worker with the Georgia Department of Transportation, was directly traffic and wouldn't let Steiner's car into a closed lane. Shiner stopped and climbed out of his pickup truck and told Kasparine to move out of the way and Kasparine said Steiner said, move or I will run you over. Steiner got back in the car and drove it, kidding Kasparine lightly. He then told him again to move or he'd run him over, and then hit him a second time. Kasparine wasn't seriously hurt as he just tapped him. Steiner showed up to plead guilty to terroristic threats, but his attorney told the judge that he doesn't believe he committed a crime and that he plead guilty only because he thought the jury might convict him because of his public persona. Read that wrestling heel character. The plea bargain agreed to was that Steiner would be put on probation for five years and pay a $2,676 fine and it would be removed from his record as a first offender if he completed his probation period. When the judge heard the story, he believed Steiner wasn't guilty of terroristic threats if that's all he did. Buy rate estimates for the World War III pay-per-view have ranged from 0.55 to 0.7 which is well below what these shows have been doing, but still not a big surprise since nobody expected it to do well. We don't have a figure for Survivor Series yet, but it was expected to do better than the 0.8 to 0.9 range that WWF has claimed its pay-per-view had been doing for the past several months.
The ECW November to Remember looks to be in the ballpark with its previous show which was a little better than in 0.2. Final figures on the last UFC, with a heavily constricted universe, also are finishing up at in 0.55. Nitro on November 30th in Chattanooga drew a sellout 8,025 paying $136,500. The show was better than it has been in a while. Eric Bischoff named Steiner as the new leader of NWO Hollywood, and Steiner said he and Horace Hogan would challenge Scott Hall to a tag match later in the show. There may be a storyline of dissension with other members of NWO Hollywood over Steiner being picked as the new leader. Conan won the TV title from Jericho in 7-10 in a really good match. You know the reason for the title switch. Jericho did a super job in this match and they traded near falls until Conan hit a facebuster on the title belt for the pin, which got an incredible pop as Luger and Nash came to the ring to congratulate Conan. Flair did an interview challenging Bischoff to a match. Flair had something to say and talked about various people who had built the company dating back to Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDaniel and even mentioned Ricky Steamboat, who had a lawsuit against the company, and the Road Warriors, who worked for the rival company, in his interview. Scott Hall agreed to the match but didn't have a partner and Nash agreed to be his partner. Seemed to me to be way too fast to already reunite the outsiders, but you know what the ratings game does to people. Steve and Scott Armstrong beat Raven and Canyon in 335. Raven walked out on the match. Canyon put the flatliner on Steve, but then was pinned by Scott with a schoolboy. Usually there is a huge pop when the jobber beats the star because nobody expects it, but for whatever reason, this match and the finish got no reaction. Hart did an interview saying because of his groin injury, legit, although in the storyline he's faking, he couldn't wrestle. But Paige came out and called him names. Hart agreed to do the match as long as it was no DQ. Hart had this hilarious line when fans were taunting him about his injury saying that none of them even have groins. Kidman beat Eddie Guerrero to keep the cruiserweight title in 10-14 when Juventud Guerrero tried to interfere, but Rey Mysterio Jr. ran in and hit a springboard dropkick on Eddie to set up Kidman using the shooting star for the pin. Very good match. LWO chased Kidman and Mysterio Jr. to the back after the match. Bischoff and Wyndham came out and called out Malenko. The other horseman besides Flair came with him, but he came to the ring by himself. Bischoff said that if Malenko, with his storyline bad leg, could beat Wyndham, then he'd agree to wrestle Flair. After Malenko agreed, Bischoff said that Dusty Rhodes would be the ref. Wrath destroyed Bobby Blaze with a meltdown in 27. Ernest Miller challenged anyone from the back to come out. Perry Saturn came out. Miller said he was going to protect Saturn from a beating and wouldn't fight him. It wound up with Saturn wrestling Ono. First Miller distracted the ref and Glacier kicked Saturn, but he kicked out of Ono's pin. Miller then threw Ono a chain, but Saturn instead hit the Death Valley driver on Ono for the pin in 112. However, as he was being pinned Ono put the chain in Saturn's trunks, missed by the camera and the announcers, the ref saw the chain on Saturn and reversed the decision. Not as bad as it sounds. They did a Goldberg vs. Nash contract signing, in which they announced Goldberg wouldn't be defending the title until Starcade. Bigelow at ringside, tried to hit the ring but was thrown out of the building. The rest of the show they cut away to shots of Bigelow in the back of the building calling out Goldberg like a schoolyard street fight. Booker T pinned Mike Enos in 328 with a sidewalk slam. T still isn't wrestling up to par. Lex Luger racked Brian Adams in 507. Real bad except the finish was well executed with Vincent holding a chair and Adams hitting it, leading to the rack. Malenko beat Wyndham via DQ in a match that despite the build-up, had no heat. Wyndham was just kicking the hell out of Malenko when Rhodes out of nowhere DQ'd Wyndham, turning face. Bischoff then fired Rhodes, who was turning back babyface, saving us from a Rhodes vs. Zabishko matchup that had been planned, for months. All the horsemen including Flair were beating on Wyndham after the match. Hall and Nash beat Steiner and Horace in 725 of a bad match. Hall gave Horace the edge but the NWO ref wouldn't count. Nash power bombed the NWO ref and Billy Silverman ran in and counted as Hall got the pin. Boring match and it didn't have nearly the heat you'd think for the Outsiders' first match back. The pop when they came out together was a real disappointment and the match, with Hall selling, really didn't get over until the very finish. Goldberg and Bigelow had a great brawl outside. It was good because they didn't do wrestling moves and instead worked it to look like a real fight and both had a lot of intensity. For all the knocks at Goldberg, and the whole Jericho situation is hard to explain to anyone, at least he looks good in what he does, and has a great intensity to go along with his charisma and look. They were pulled apart, but Goldberg broke free and speared Bigelow on the grass, and then they were pulled apart again.
Page versus Hart wound up with Hart not doing anything but standing there while Giant Choke slammed Page twice, the second time off the ropes and Hart used the sharpshooter and the ref dropped Page's hand three times in 414 for Hart's regaining the title. Legitimately, Hart had been wrestling with a groin injury ever since the first time he brought it up on television about a month ago. It got worse doing a crotch spot in the Malenko match on November 23rd and he wasn't supposed to wrestle for a while. The reason he didn't even suit up was because he hadn't brought his gear because there was no way he could wrestle because legit he was having a hard time walking even though the plan was for him to get the belt. Instead of not delivering the advertised match, they came up with that scenario. The idea behind it is to set up Page vs. Giant at Starcade, with Page going over clean, unless Giant signs. First day ticket sales for the January 4th Georgia Dome were about 15,500, which was actually a disappointment as the company predications were 23,000 to 25,000 going in. At press time they were at just under 20,000 tickets sold for about $650,000, which are phenomenal numbers. The place is scaled this time for 44,820 tickets and $1.2 million, and the goal is to break the $41,412 and $906,330 record set on July 6th for the last show in the building. There is talk of Hogan appearing on this show to do some sort of a farewell, or an angle leading to his return. Houston on December 7th is at about 24,000 tickets and St. Louis on December 21st is up to 27,300 tickets. No thunder this week due to Thanksgiving. There also will be no thunder on December 24th due to Christmas Eve. It appears they won't be doing the Tuesday Nitros anymore. TNT asked for shows every week in December, but WCW tried to convince them otherwise because there is no way to go a fourth hour of TV without the audience being comatose, the wrestlers being exhausted and the announcers working on fumes. It appears the November 24th show will be the final one and it did a 2.43 rating. Mike Tenne missed the November 30th show with laryngitis, which was actually acknowledged on the air and they told the truth. Remember that because it may be the last time. Although Lee Marshall was there, he wasn't used as a third man, which is something of a slap. Marshall had been politicking for more airtime, including a hotline this past week where he called Nash the most creative man in the business and said the page story of working his way to the top was the greatest story in the history of wrestling. Correction from last week when we said Mysterio Jr. had gotten a title match on weekend TV after they did the angle costing him the title match on the pay-per-view. Actually on the TV it was Mysterio Jr. vs. Kidman, and Kidman didn't win the title until the next day so the title match on that TV show was Guerrero vs. Super Colo. Colo is moving to Chicago from Mexico City. For November 13th in England head-to-head, -head, Raw did 350,000 viewers, Nitro did 290,000 and ECW did 80,000. For November 20th, Raw did 290,000 to Nitro's 250,000 which makes four weeks in a row that Raw has won the England ratings race. House shows this weekend saw November 27th in Augusta, Georgia drew 4,233 paying $84,555. November 28th in Johnston City, Tennessee drew 4,958 paying $93,745. And December 1st WCW Saturday night tapings in Rome, Georgia drew a sellout 2,497 paying $48,635. The numbers aren't that great considering Thanksgiving weekend traditionally is the best weekend of the year to draw in wrestling. Merchandise for the week including Nitro but not including Rome, Georgia was $133,015 or $6.17 per head. Main events for all three house shows were scheduled as Page vs. Hart and ended up with Brian Adams subbing on top. They announced that Hart wasn't there due to transportation problems. It was real funny in Johnson City since they announced Hart not being there for transportation problems at the beginning of the show. When Adams came out he said over the PA that Hart wasn't there because Page had beaten him up so badly he was in the hospital and he was out for revenge. Then in Knoxville, they were back to the transportation problems. WCW Worldwide in New York wins its time slot with a 5.9 local rating. WWF New York, which airs in a 2.30 a.m. time slot, still does a 2.0 rating which is considered fantastic at that time. Although it isn't officially settled, for all practical purposes, the legal actions back and forth between WCW and Flair are settled. Van Hammer was an honorary cheerleader during the Cowboys-Vikings Thanksgiving game and was pointed out by John Madden as wrestler Van Hammer. Chad Fortune appeared on WCW Saturday night wearing his pit crew outfit but worked as a jobber. The November 30th San Diego Union Tribune ran a review of the Hart movie. Columnist Don Freeman gave it a huge thumbs up saying it is one compelling story. 
I recommend it all the way. Director Paul, Jay has come up with a gem here a first-rate documentary. Hart and Bischoff were both filming a segment, for NBC TV's Dateline on December 1st. Not sure of the air date. CNN is also doing a feature shortly on the wrestling war. Tickets for the February 1st Nitro in Minneapolis at Target Center won't go on sale until January 15th, as to coincide with Jesse Ventura's inaugural ball. They're looking at sending Flair to Minneapolis again for the first day sales. House show lineups for January 8th in Winston-Salem, also January 9th Terre Haute and January 10th Evansville, as Flair and Benoit and Malenko vs. Hennigan Ray and Adams, Page vs. Bigelow, McMichael vs. Finley, Eddie Guerrero vs. Mysterio Jr. and more. January 30th at the Forum in Los Angeles, and January 29th in San Diego, have Nash vs. Goldberg for WCW title, Hart vs. Sting for US title, Steiner and Bagwell, in his first weekend back and boy did they waste a million dollar angle or what? Versus Luger and Conan, Flair vs. Wyndham, if Flair wins he gets 5 minutes with Bischoff and I wonder where that idea came from, Hall vs. Horace, Kidman vs. Mysterio Jr., Chavo vs. Alex Wright and a Lucha six-man. WWF Raw on November 30th from Baltimore drew a sellout 11,006 paying $243,220 for a good action-adventure show. Headbangers and ICP, who had their TV commercial air for their CD on Heat the night before and it was also announced Bangers and ICP vs. Oddities and Luna in a match reminiscent of the Doink the Clown era for the December 13th pay-per-view, came out but Austin stunned all of them and did an interview talking about getting Undertaker and Bearer. Outlaws beat Gangrel and Edge via DQ when, watch a pattern develop, Christian interfered hitting Billy with a tag belt for the DQ. Shamrock and Bossman made the save for the Outlaws, as they spent the night before in much of the show teasing Outlaws joining Team Corporate, which led to next week's show. Undertaker locked Austin in a meat locker. Mark Henry asked D. Low Brown to go on a date with him. Actually these date segments were great as China wasn't interested no matter how nice Henry was to her. They are trying to push China as being more feminine with her new face. Anyway, it was the first time Henry ever did anything really good in this business. By the end of the show, Henry left go powder his nose as some guys came onto her. She decked one, and when Henry saw what was happening, he went berserk on all of them. The guys coming onto China was really lame, but Henry did a great job of acting pissed. Undertaker is now doing a heel religious maniac speaking in tongues gimmick this week. He challenged Kane who came out. They brawled until Taker hit a tombstone. Bearer then tried to get Kane committed but he sat up and ran into the crowd, knocking down a few of the orderlies before leaving. X-Pac confronted Michaels. They made few disgusting remarks about the size of their respective buttholes and stools before Michaels ordered him to defend the European title against Shamrock and said if he didn't do it, he'd send him back to the money pit in Atlanta. Goldust beat Jarrett via DQ in 328. Jarrett got this huge face pop coming out. I know it was really McMichael who got the face pop but we can all pretend Jarrett's new gimmick is getting over. Bad match. Golda set up shattered dreams but McMichael got in the way and started slowly pulling down her top. Before she could do it, Owen Hart, who was doing commentary hit the ring and attacked Goldust for the DQ. Blue Blazer came in to help but then turned on Hart and pulled his mask off revealing Blackman. Bossman won the hardcore title for Mankind in 6-12 of a disappointing ladder match. Bossman has always been a great gimmick, but once the bell rings, he's Ray Trailer in a cop outfit. Rock interfered to cost Mankind the title. After the match Michaels hit Mankind several times with Bossman's Billy Club. Undertaker and Kane brawled in a room and Taker KO'd Kane with a chair and told Bearer to get the orderlies as he put Kane in a body bag. However Austin clocked Taker with a shovel and he and Kane put him in the body bag while Bearer was gone. Another thing about that shovel angle. The more they show the replays of Taker hitting Austin with a shovel, the more you see him clearly block the shovel with his forearms. Anyway, they gimmick the shovel to break upon impact with Taker's forearms. Dwayne Gill beat Mero in a match where Mero said he's retire if he lost. They were really making fun of retirement since Hart was also doing a phony retirement gimmick. Mero was winning when Blue Meanie shoved him off the top rope, and Gill pinned him in 209. Meany is in full-time as WWF contacted him on November 23rd to come in with Stevie Richards as new members of the job squad, but they wanted the idea for Philadelphia and some other cities that it was outsiders from ECW. You can only do that outsiders angle once every year or two and when you do it, it usually means big business, so why even bother wasting it on this? But Paul Heyman complained about them portraying Richards as being from ECW. 
I don't believe that's the reason Richards wasn't there and don't know why his debut fell through although WWF was leery about bringing him in as a wrestler due to his broken neck. My guess is Meanie was picked because they saw how Ralphus has gotten over in WCW. Kind of funny because WWF has been on a lot of people's cases about their weight and physique and then they bring Meanie in. Shamrock beat X-Pac via DQ in 443. Michaels distracted the ref and bossman clotheslined X-Pac after he'd done the X-Factor, facebuster, on Shamrock. Shamrock put on the ankle lock but Helmsley returned to a big pop and attacked Shamrock for the DQ. Match wasn't as good as you'd think. The orderlies took Taker away although Bearer thought it was Kane. Venus beat Tiger Ali Singh in 259 when Terry Runnels hit Venus with a low blow. Between the three hoes, Jacqueline and Runnels, they had enough silicon at ringside to create normal-sized implants for every woman in the province of Newfoundland. Farouk and Bradshaw, called the Acolytes, as WWF again tries to shackle Jackal with the most boring tag team in the sport, attacked Singh and Babu. Actually it was a hoot when the hoes were all rubbing themselves on Babu, and he was freaking out wondering what diseases he was about to come down with. Shane McMahon brought out Sable to come out with new WWF cologne and perfume. Shane, who is another hoot, started looking down her top and she sprayed the cologne in his eyes. Rock beat Snow to keep the title. Snow clotheslined the ref. He got hit with rock bottom and Rock did the elbow on the head. Snow hit Rock with the head but Shamrock and Bossman came out and attacked Snow ending with Rock doing the rock bottom in 458. Bossman and Shamrock beat up Mankind after the match until Holly Scorpio and Gil came out for the save. Show ended with Austin and Kane cornering Bearer, taking him into the ring where he peed in his pants, well, actually they said he probably did but since he was wearing dark pants we couldn't see. Austin was about to stab him in the chest, but changed his mind and they dragged him out of the arena and threw him into a manhole, he actually fit, and the show ended with Bearer supposedly in the sewer. After the cameras went off, Rock got in the ring, Austin came out and Austin gave Rock four stunners, including once when they were drinking beer together as buddies and Rock turned on him, and also gave Shane McMahon two stunners. They also taped Super Astros and Shotgun going back and forth since the East Coast audience the night before hated Super Astros. Stemming from Philadelphia, they had Negro Casas and El Eo Del Santo over Apollo Dantes and Jose Estrada Jr. when Casas pinned Estrada with La Magistral, Armando Fernandez over Julio Sanchez and Mini Max beat Torito in a match which were told stole the entire show. Not much on Shotgun. December 1st taping in New Haven Open with a dark match as Jason Arndt beat someone. Steve Bradley, who looked pretty good and showed good charisma including doing a moonsault off the top to the floor, beat Nick Barberry in a tryout match. Heat for December 6th started with Gil beating Taka clean to keep the title. After the match, Kayontai cried in the ring and Bradshaw and Farouk came out to beat them all up. Animal and Droz beat too much when Droz used a half crab on Taylor. They played it up as if Taylor's knee was hurt and Christopher had to carry him to the back and they showed them giving medical treatment to him. Hart did an interview saying he's coming out of retirement to wrestle Blackman at rock bottom. Brood NC Shamrock and Bossman and Rock when Triple H and X-Pac attacked Team Corporate and Outlaws attacked Brood. Finally Triple H and X and Outlaws had a stare down. Jarrett beat Henry via DQ when Deborah came out. Jarrett went for the guitar but Brown interfered and got the guitar and hit Jarrett with it for the DQ. After the match, Bulldust challenged Jarrett to a match where if he loses, he has to strip naked in the ring but if Jarrett loses, Deborah has to strip naked right there on pay-per-view. What are the odds of delivering on that stip? Luna and Kurgan no contest sing and Babu and Luna was beating the hell out of poor Babu in the crowd and it just ended. They don't even bother announcing winners and losers half the time anymore. Taker wrestled Mankind with Austin in the front row. Austin threw a drink in Taker's face and Mankind jumped Taker. Rock ran in and started the double team when Austin made the save and the show ended. Raw opened with Triple H and X-Pac wanting to know about the Outlaws. Outlaws came out in suits and did a new ring intro calling themselves the new corporate Outlaws and brought out Michaels. Michaels and Triple H argued. Said to be real good, and also real vulgar. At one point and even though Michaels' brain seemed scrambled from all the concussions, this had to be a spot. Michaels stood there and froze. He walked away while Triple H laughed. He pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket like it was a script and started reading it and came back and finished the interview. If that segment is edited out, maybe he really did have brain lock but I'm guessing it airs. Michaels accused Triple H of gimmick infringement and got mad at him for saying how Triple H said Michaels dropped the ball at WrestleMania. Michaels wasn't nearly as over as you'd think. Michaels announced X and Triple H vs Shamrock and Bossman anything goes for later in the show. Brown beat Jarrett when Goldust came to ringside in an overcoat and flashed Jarrett 
wearing nothing but underwear underneath, and Brown schoolboyed him. Bangers vs. Gangrel and Edge ended when Luna attacked Bangers and Singh and Babu attacked Luna and Oddities saved her. Goldust beat hard. Deborah came out in an overcoat and flashed Goldust wearing nothing but a black bra and panties, but Goldust didn't care, but Owen did, and he wound up distracted and pinned. Godfather came out and gave the host to a plant at ringside. Godfather and Venus NC Bradshaw and Farouk in a bad match that went nowhere. At this point they stopped taping and brought out a cross and poured lighter fluid on it. While this was going on, Gil beat Bradley in a dark match. Austin came out for his interview and the cross was on fire and Undertaker made some weird religious threats. Blackman beat Singh beat Blazer ran out and tripped on the ramp and rolled down the ramp. Blackman was beating him up until Hart made the save. Henry beat Droz when China came out and Droz told her to hit Henry. She refused, he got mad, she hit him and Henry splashed him. Shamrock and Bossman vs X-Pac and Triple H was a great match with great heat. Michaels and Outlaws came out. Michaels threw a chair to Shamrock. Bossman held Triple H but Billy Gunn asked Shamrock for the chair. Of course Gunn hit Shamrock. Outlaws ripped off their shirts revealing DX t-shirts. Place went nuts. This sets up Outlaws vs Shamrock and Bossman for the pay-per-view. Finally Austin and Mankind vs Taker and Rock. Four druids showed up with the cross. You can see where this one is headed. Austin and Taker were brawling and Taker KO'd Austin with a really bad looking chair shot. After all the sick stuff Mankind takes, Austin's been having to sell some lame stuff of late. Anyway they wound up tie Austin to the cross and crucifying him, raising the cross. It's not like ECW didn't do this and get kicked off the air for it, but that was another year and everything is different now. Triple A just did this November 23rd with heavy metal. They shut off the cameras. With the cameras off, Austin got off the cross and hit Rock, Shamrock and Bossman with stunners to send everyone home happy. First sign of little problems. Last week Sable was scheduled to do an appearance at a Mervyn's in Bakersfield and the store cancelled because they claimed this product wasn't something they wanted to be associated with. The NBC affiliate in Scranton ran a piece about the Catholic Youth Center slash WWF deal. Bishop James Timlin gave his side and on TV they showed Godfather with the hose bending over and lifting up their dresses from last week. Timlin said that wrestling would be welcome back to the building as soon as it cleans up its act. Nash Bridges is interested in having Austin do an episode. The Portland, Maine newspaper ran a story on Scott Taylor building up to the November 27th house show in that city. Taylor is from Portland. Winnipeg Sun ran a story this week on Jackal, who also does a bi-weekly column in their paper. Jackal says he wants to be mayor of Winnipeg. Weekend house shows saw November 27th in Portland, Maine drew a sellout 7,696 paying $160,135, November 28th in Boston drew a sellout 16,510 paying $331,370 and the Astros and Heat taping November 29th in Philadelphia drew a sellout 18,364 paying $389,335 so they are on a five-show sellout streak including Baltimore and New Haven. Merchandise for the week was $344,027 or $6.42 per head. Austin and Taker had Portland off so they went with Rock beating Kane in a cage match with Bossman as ref. Boston was largely the same show as all the other house shows other than Triple H returning replacing Regal, who was sent home and hasn't been brought back due to his being in no condition to perform on the last tour. Triple H who was from the Boston area originally, got a huge pop for his appearance and mic work, but he and Snow had a slow-paced match with no heat and got a lot of boring chants. Triple H reacted by flipping off fans who chanted boring. It was an afternoon show and Austin's match started at 3.16pm same finish as usual and same good match. Apparently most fans thought Austin had won the title when he pinned Rock after the stunner in the four-way main event, and when it was announced it had been a non-title match, never made clear before the match started, fans began pelting the ring with garbage. The Super Astros that aired on November 29th saw Papi Chulo over Manuel Gomez, Monterey wrestler Antifas del Norte without his mask. Gomez was incredible doing a one-man show with one move after another out of this world. The first February 3rd of this match blew away anything in WWF and WCW. However, Papi's comeback punches were so weak the live crowd in Texas booed the finish pretty bad. Miguel Perez beat Super Loco, Super Crazy, in about one minute of a match that saw a few missed spots. They pushed Austin vs. Taker as the main event of Rock Bottom trying to tell the entire career story of Austin from 1996 to present in two minutes. Finally Casas beat Fanaki in a so-so match. After the match Dick Togo, in perfect Spanish, challenged Casas to a match next week. 
fans were chanting USA at both guys. Go figure. Minnie Max tried to ask Maria Felipe out for a date and got sad when she nicely said no, crying that she wouldn't go out with him because he wasn't tall enough. Ratings were significantly up from the first week, with Los Angeles doing a 6.7, New York a 5.1, San Antonio a 4.7, Miami a 3.9 and Chicago a 14.0. TV tapings November 29th in Philadelphia saw Andrew Martin win using the meltdown as his finisher in a dark match. Santo beat Estrada. Lucha and Puerto Rican style are different so they clashed, and this was bad. Besides Estrada must be 8 inches taller and 75 pounds heavier so it must have looked stupid. Torito beat Mini Max in a real good match. Casas DDQ Dantes when Estrada and Santo did a run-in. Crowd was totally dead for all of this. For Shotgun, Outlaws beat DOA. Singh beat Goldust via DQ Bros over Mero and Kayantai over Farouk and Bradshaw in 4 on 2 by DQ. As part of its deal with Univision, none of the talent put over on Super Astros can appear on Raw, which will keep WWF from using the Mexican stars as jobbers on American television. That also means guys like Perez and Castillo can't work English TV. For Heat, which aired on a few hours tape delay, Christian beat Gil via DQ when Christian used his Tomakes but Meany ran in, with them doing the deal about him beating an intruder from ECW. The run-in was really mad. Brown beat Blackman via countout when Blackman was fighting with Blazer, who definitely wasn't Hart. Blazer on purpose got his cape caught and couldn't fight back. Godfather and Venus beat Bangers when Godfather gave Thrasher the pimp drop in 207. Oddities fought Bangers after in an unbelievably bad brawl. X-Pac pinned Henry in 151 with the X-Factor. They said Henry didn't care because he was only thinking about his date with China. Kane beat Jarrett via DQ in 214 with the guitar shot. Kane didn't sell it and chased Jarrett and McMichael away after. Real bad. Finally Bossman and Shamrock beat Mankind and Snow in 241 when Bossman hit Snow with the billy club for the pin and the ring filled up after the match. The next MSG show on December 27th should set an all-time non-pay-per-view record gate since they raised prices $5 across the board to a $35 top. Washington Post had a huge wrestling story on November 27th. Same stuff except it closed with a discussion of how Goldberg will react when he inevitably has to go heel. Raw in Tacoma on December 14th is already sold out with close to a $400,000 advance. Chula Vista Star News did a story on Shamrock who lives in nearby Bonita, San Diego area. Shamrock said that 50% of the guys from the 80s shouldn't have been in there because it was all gimmick, but today the wrestlers are almost all great athletes. He said his kids watch wrestling but when he wrestles people like X-Pac, his kids cheer for X-Pac to beat him. He said the UFC was easier physically than WWF because you're taking bumps 20 nights a month. The Reader's Pages Hart Just finished watching the Bret Hart video. Some great filmmaking and a very professional job. It was scary to see Hart talking about his hitman character as if it was real. It was also sad to hear McMahon lie to his face. It seems Hart's wife was the only one to see things clearly. Scott Wallace Billerica, Massachusetts WWF slash WCW Let me get this straight. If I take my family and friends to a WWF or WCW show, I can expect that at least some of the advertised matches won't take place, that some of the advertised stars won't be there. And if it's TV, that at least some of the action will take place in a location where we can't see what's happening, and for every minute of actual wrestling there will be five minutes of interviews. This non-wrestling will include profane verbiage and obscene gestures. Finally most of the matches will consist of wrestlers trading punches for five minutes or less, at which point people will run in for a DQ. What fun that must be to watch four guys punch and kick a helpless individual into the ground. This is wrestling, or sports entertainment, as Vince McMahon puts it, of the 90s and it's riding a wave of unbelievable popularity. Somehow I must be living in an Alice in Wonderland world. Michael Weiner, Encino, California. I went to a boxing match the other night. When one boxer had the other in trouble with a flurry of punches, the crowd was on their feet cheering. My first reaction was to look back at the entrance way to see who was doing a run-in. I've been watching too much WCW. Jesse Reyes. San Antonio, Texas. The November 16th Raw was brilliant. It's about time they gave Hawk a push. Harry Simon. Las Vegas, Nevada. Tributes. I enjoyed the Tributes book to the extent it was hard to put down, despite the fact that I had already read the vast majority of the stories upon initial release. I noted that, for obvious reasons. You predict that each premature death won't be the last and, without a doubt, another follows shortly thereafter. I'll bet that like me, 
many readers have the feeling that Scott Hall will be included in Volume 2. What is especially interesting to me is the effect the book has the potential to create among people who read it. Personally, I'm a 33-year-old male, professionally employed making a pretty nice living with a pretty steady habit of booze and recreational drugs, although likely nowhere near the level of the majority of those profiled. My pastimes include coke, marijuana hash, etc. Despite repeated attempts, I've never been successful in stopping or really been that interested in slowing down. I know this isn't practical if I want to live to a ripe old age but, despite the sound advice of many friends and family members, I've maintained this lifestyle for several years now. What moved me is that, after reading the Carrie Von Eric, Brian Pillman and Louis Piccoli stories consecutively the other night, I actually found myself not lighting up that second joint or snorting that extra line. I've also noticed a greater consciousness about the volume of hard drugs like cocaine which I may ingest, and especially about mixing them with alcohol. While all this may seem like common sense, I can't recall anything else in a long time having this kid of an effect on my thought process. Frankly the articles had an eerie feeling to them especially when read consecutively, and I got scared. The effect seems to be a positive one and although maybe not permanent, it surely is a step in the right direction. I really don't want to go cold turkey right now, as I do enjoy this lifestyle and to date, have been pretty successful, but thank you for making me open my eyes. After reading this book from cover to cover, I know it really can happen to me. Name withheld by request. This is the end of this issue. See you next time. <laughs>